is Ron Stauffer. I'll be bringing the message today. And uh, today is the 26th day of February in the year of our Lord, 2023. We'll be talking a little bit today about the uh, Bible study conference, the pastor's conference that some of us went to this week. Uh, I want you to know it was, it was renewing, it was humbling. And in that spirit of humility, we, our message uh, at the conference was this, knowing God, knowing God. And the, the messages were pr just profound from the pastors that came and taught. I would encourage you all to get onto the Calvary Chapel Merritt Island website and look up the conference. It was, it was streamed live. It's recorded there for you, including the worship times of music. Which, uh, which was amazing in, in, in itself and very renewing. But uh, I want to tell you that um, I came away very, very humbled. Very humbled. Uh, because knowing God is just a powerful thing, and it's kind of a dangerous thing in the sense that, I mean, you, you want to get intimate with the master of the universe who speaks everything into existence with his voice. Um, God is dangerous, and that's good. That's a good thing. God made us, and he gets to call the shots, make the rules, and judge as he sees fit. I'm impressed to open with a psalm today. If you would turn to Psalm 51 with me. Psalm 51. This is a prayer of repentance to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. This is after his sin uh, and after the, they conceived a child together, and after he had murdered a man, the husband of a woman that he took advantage of, and their baby died, and he's broken. He's completely broken. He's totally aware of his corruption. And part of this conference and my ex experiences and thoughts in the past week make me aware of my own corruptness as well. And this psalm is, uh, just remain seated, but I want to read this as a prayer. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I, ac I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the, guilt of, uh, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, 
a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good, do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. And I won't add anything to that prayer except to say, Amen, Lord, have your way with me, according to this psalm. So our message today is going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. You see the title up there, Remember the Creator While You Are Young, Remember Him When You Are Old. The original title that I came up with was, What's So Great About Growing Old? But I, I didn't want to, like, you know, unsell the message before I even started. So uh, we made it a little more appealing here. We're going to look at age today. We're going to look at youth and, and old age and uh, the, the pleasures and the goodness that goes with. I say goodness. I shouldn't even say goodness. The, 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 the pleasures and the vigors that go with youth and the uh, maturity and the growth that comes with age and hopefully wisdom also. Speaking of wisdom, I want to make a correction from a message from our message last week. And I just really stepped into it last week when I confused the name of uh, Job with, who was it? Solomon. Okay, yeah, so I said that Job was a deeply flawed character. Wrong. I was wrong. And, and you weren't shy to correct me on that. Thank you for that. Job was not a deeply flawed character, at least, at least as presented in the scripture. In fact, the Lord even kind of bragged on Job and said, have you considered my servant Job? The righteous man. The Lord was pleased with Job. There, there was, he didn't find iniquity in Job. There's a lot to criticize about Solomon. And that's who I was referring to as Solomon. So I even, th I even thought about pulling the messages off of YouTube and Facebook this week because of that. Um, I may still go back and add some notes or do some edits or something. But, uh, yeah, don't, please don't be uh, uh, led astray by my uh, misspeaking last week. Uh, I would like to blame it on getting older, but I can't. <laughs> so uh, I want to share a couple of... Uh, just things that have happened in the, in the last week or so that really just led into this message today. And uh, that is, uh, so first we went to the conference, and I had, I had bought, you've seen me preach from this Bible here. I bought this like nine years ago at the Bible bookstore at Calvary Chapel of Merritt Island, and it was great, and I preached from it for, uh, I had a Bible that was about, before that, you know, several pounds and large, and it was a, a commentary Bible, and I didn't want a commentary Bible to, to teach from because I, ju I just want the Word of God in the Bible that I'm teaching from. And so I went and I kind of traded it in. I bought this Bible, and it was great, and I preached from it with no problem for uh, years. And uh, then I must have spilled water on it or something because all the letters shrank. <laughs> and so I, I went into the bookstore with my tongue firmly in my cheek, and I said, like, I have a complaint about something you sold me nine years ago. I, j just because I get it wet or spill coffee on it, it uh, like it's broken. The Bible you gave me is broken, and the letters have all shrunk. So I want a Bible that's fixed, that's not broken. And so they sold me this one, and like you can read the words from there. <laughs> I think word must have already gotten around before that because uh, one of the people who attended with us bought me this uh, Bible magnifier. He <laughs> said, Pastor, I just, I just felt like you should have this because of the way you've been talking about having a hard time reading your scriptures and so on. So, uh, yeah, so out goes the broken Bible and in with the new. And then uh, this morning I got up and uh, yesterday I had been doing some work on the farm and I had been using my, you've seen my knife that clips onto my pocket here. I use my knife constantly. It's an extension of my hand. And I was cutting um, baling twine and setting up a, a goat pen for 
purposes of isolating goats from each other and so on and tying it up with baling twine and cutting the rope. And this morning I got up, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find my knife. And I'm like calling out to Ruth. I said, Ruth, I can't go to church. I can't find my knife. Like, I can't leave the house because a man's not dressed until he has a knife in his pocket. That's the way it works. And so I just I kind of panicked. And I went to all the places, and, like, the time is going away. And, and then I thought, okay, I probably have, like, an old knife somewhere here. And so I went and I dug into the drawer at the nightstand, and I dug down really deep where things that you forgot about, you know, years ago are down there, you know, cracker crumbs and you know, old energy bars and, you know, bailing twine and, you know, coins from other countries and things like that. And I found this, this knife, which I don't usually carry one that fits in your pocket. I usually carry a clip on one. Here's a Swiss Army knife. And it's got a couple of attachments on it. And I went, oh, man, I wonder if that even still works. And, uh, ooh, yeah, I got the blade open now. So, uh, it was really hard. I, I had to go to the kitchen and get a butter knife to pry, o pry it open. And, uh, and I tried to work it and get everything to work. And I, my thumbnail kept bending when I tried to open the different attachments to it. And so I just took a, uh, one of those nail, fingernail brushes and soap and water and scrubbed it and everything. And got some sewing machine oil, or actually gun oil, and uh, oiled it up real good and worked it several times and so on. And it's like, I don't know, this knife is old. It's decades and decades old, and it's been sitting in the bottom of a drawer. And now it's been returned to useful service. But because it was old, it had gotten stiff. And it didn't want to work the way I wanted it to work anymore. And I thought, I think there's a sermon illustration in here somewhere. <laughs> so then I go out to my car, and I'm getting into the car, and I got my coffee, and I'm, I'm ready to go. And, and I look down on the ground, and there's this. Brand new snakeskin there that was still, like, wet. No, no, in a good way. It was still, like, fresh and very pliable and not crispy yet. It had just been shed probably minutes before I got there. And this is a small snake. It's young. You know, this is probably a garter snake. It probably has another six, 16 inches to grow in its life. And uh, the scales are very tiny. It's like a, not a baby snake, but maybe, maybe a one-year-old snake. And it just got me to thinking, you know, we shed old things as we grow. We, we shed the things that are no longer useful to us, that don't serve us well, that you know, this skin, if it left on it, would blind the snake. It would eventually block its vision. And the snake, in order to grow, has to give up old things, has to give up its old skin, and it sheds it. And it's just a reminder to me of the, the aging process. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. This is very good. The snake was shedding the ways of its youth, and it was... Uh, becoming older and better and hopefully wiser in the ways of survival. And I thought, there's a sermon illustration in there somewhere. And my daughter, I told, I went and I showed the, to uh, one of my daughters and she said, Dad, everything's a sermon illustration with you. She said, like, and she told me, you know what they say about pastor's kids, right? The pastor says to his child, you know, everything that you ever say can and will become a sermon illustration someday, so watch it. <laughs> but uh, the Lord gives us these little lessons if we keep our eyes open to his, to his truths. And, and hopefully he's building into your life too, where you read the scripture and you go like, Lord, show me. Show me what this is about. And and be aware and be conscious that it may, he may give you an illustration of what that's about just in your life or in the next conversation that you have. Yeah. So it was a, it was a good week, a, good, a week of learning, a week of humility, a week of the awareness of my sin. And uh, I pray the same thing for you, that you would be aware 
and, and aware of your sin, your shortcomings, so that you can also approach God with this attitude that David had in Psalm 51, which is to, to always be repentant and to be aware of our iniquity. Would you rise with me as I read uh, Ecclesiastes, our passage today, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And you will see in here that in verse 1, it begins with, remember now your creator. And he's speaking to youths, to young people. And then in verse 6, he, it's almost the exact same phrase, remember your creator. But then he's speaking into the future, not, not about youths. He's speaking about the time when you're at death, literally at death's door about to expire, about to, about to die. Uh, I will uh, also say that this passage is very difficult among scholars, and I found, I found zero widespread agreement about the individual lines in here. Many, many, many commentators, and a few of them agree about anything, individually, line by line. But as far as what's going on here and the broad teaching in here, it's almost universal agreement on what's going on. And we'll get into that. Seek God uh, early in your life. Verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult or the evil days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the days when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim. When the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden, and desire fails, for man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Lord, help us to understand this uh, passage and not to focus on the areas of disagreement about individual line items in here, Lord, but God, give us the big picture. Give us something to take home today with us. Lord, we pray that you would always keep yourself in the front of our mind so that we would remember our creator. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks. Have a seat. You see what I mean? about those individual lines, golden bowl, silver cord, shattered pitchers, what is going on? As I was uh, trying to figure it out and just reading all the different commentaries about what it means about uh, the, sh the broken bowl and the loosed cord and the doors that don't open and all kinds of things. It's, it was like a song to me with, song, with confusing song lyrics. And, and this song kept going through my head. I've been through the desert on a horse with no name. It felt good to get out of the rain. In the desert, you can remember your name because there ain't no one to give you no pain. Like, say what? Those lyrics are confusing to me. It's hard to make, make sense of them. And indeed, uh, this passage that we just read, this is by the preacher who was also a poet and a songwriter, Solomon. And he gave us some mysterious uh, lyrics, as it were. 
They don't have to be mysterious. I'm sure they made sense to him, and I'm sure that they probably made sense to the people at the time, but we don't have a great record of what they thought of them, and so future scholarship then uh, was not in full agreement on the details, but an almost universal agreement about the conclusion. And I'll give you a spoiler here. It's about being young and growing old and dying. And that's, that's what it's... That's what the general agreement is on. Remember, verse 1, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Now, now Solomon had just got done talking to, I better turn to it. Solomon had just got done in uh, chapter 11 uh, saying, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. And it seems like he's giving license to the young man, go, young man and young woman, go out and do what you want to do. But then he follows with this, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. So there's, God is watching. He's watching from, from the time of our youth until the time of our older age. And so then he says, therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. In other words, not, childhood and youth are not useless. They're not fruitless. They're just fleeting. It just means it goes quickly. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Remember now, I'm in chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come. What is that? The difficult days which have not happened yet. Why? Because you're young. So if you're young and the difficult days are yet coming, the days will come when you are old. Yeah. Exactly right. And the years draw near. Before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in that. Well, that seems like a pessimistic thing to say, Solomon. You're kind of bumming me out here because I thought, you know, getting old would be kind of glorious and I get to be wise and people seek you, my counsel and things. He says, so what are you talking about? I have no pleasure in them. Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that I will not have pleasure in my old age? Well, Remember that this, this book, my thesis about this book of Ecclesiastes, is that it has a confessional tone by a broken man who has just started out so well in his youth when he was 15 or 20 years old, and the Lord praised him. All you did was you asked me for, I told you you could have anything you want, you asked me for wisdom. You didn't ask me for all these selfish things. And so now I'm going to give you wisdom and I'm going to give you riches and power in the United Kingdom and long life. As long as you stay the course. And he didn't stay the course. And so now we have a man who's probably approaching 50, 55, which to you and me, as fairly young. Like when I moved here, I was 55 years old and somebody asked me how old you are. And I said, well, I'm 55. And they said, oh, you're just a kid. And I thought, well, that feels pretty nice. <laughs> I like that. I like being just a kid. But uh, you know that whole thing where the Lord said, uh, if you follow my ways, then I will give you long life. I will lengthen your days. Well, Solomon didn't follow God's ways. Solomon died when he was between 50 and 55. He was just a kid in one sense. I think Solomon is not having any pleasure in his waning years because the guilt is weighing on his heart. And he's taken a kingdom that was handed to him on a silver platter, a united kingdom that was at peace the entire time and God has said to him, I'm taking this away from you and I'm going to take it away from your children too. And I'm, going to, I'm going to give Israel, and another shall rule Israel, and not your heir. However, because of your father David, I will give you one tribe to rule over. And that was Judah, of course, in the south. And so it was a divided kingdom from there out. As soon as his son Rehoboam took over, then the kingdom became divided north and south, and you had... Israel in the north, and you had Judah in the south. And so David's descendants would rule Judah. What a shame. Because Solomon strayed. Because Solomon 
couldn't resist the temptations of the flesh because Solomon sought out women from foreign countries. He married out of the faith, and they brought their idolatrous ways with them. And now Solomon is getting older, and his advice to the youth is like, you know, do good now because the years are coming when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. I think he's speaking autobiographically here. This is a man of regret. He has regrets. Enjoy your youth, but remember God will judge you in all you do like he has judged me. Verse 2, we just finished in verse 1, and the, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, he's saying, this is he's speaking to the young man, he's, say, he's saying, at this point in your life, the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened for you, O young man, and the clouds do not return after the rain for you. Oh, young man. And this is where the scholarship (laughs) just goes all over the place. And it's okay, because we didn't, like, for example, you remember when Jesus would teach parables. He He would teach a parable to the multitude, and then he would retreat with his disciples to a secluded place. And the disciples come to him and go, What did you mean by that? You speak in parables and we don't get it. And then Jesus would say, oh, okay, so here's the deal. The sower and the seed and the soils, and he explained it all to them. But I speak to them in parables so that seeing they might not see, and hearing they may not hear. They might not understand. Why would God not want you to understand? Well, God God doesn't intend to lead by the hand those who have rebellious hearts. That's all he meant by that. But for you, O youth, the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. So I'll just summarize some of the more popular understandings of this passage, and you'll start to see, kind of like in the desert, on a horse with no name, felt good to get out of the rain. You can actually look up what he meant by that but almost nobody knows. And the moon and the stars, not darkened. Remember that this verse is adjunct to remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. So this is speaking about what it looks like before the difficult days come, before you get old. So while the sun, the light, the moon, the stars are still bright to you because your eyes haven't grown dim yet, you can look up at the night sky And you still see them. They're not darkened. Could mean that. Or it could mean this, that the sun, the light, the moon, and the stars are understanding. The illumination of knowledge. And then eventually, perhaps you'll get so old that your mind will start to get foggy. ponder things that you used to understand and now they don't make sense to you anymore. Maybe you don't even remember your child's name. Some of us have seen that in our kin. I don't remember your name. Or while you can still calculate a math formula in your head, you still have that illumination of understanding. You can make estimates quickly. Well, you can still quickly remember the names of people you met last month and all the names and stories of the various heads of state and explorers of the American West that you forgot about, that you'll forget about. While you're still young enough to quickly adapt to new technologies like smartphones and easily incorporate them into the fabric of your everyday life, Remember, in the days of your youth, your creator, before these things become, these other things become difficult for you. While the clouds do not return after the rain, the picture we might see here is like a rainy summer season in Florida. We're, kind, we're in the dry season right now, and it's kind of nice because you don't have to mow the lawn. 
right? Because grass doesn't grow when there's no rain. You, but once you get longer days, higher temperatures, and rain, the grass starts growing. Well, if you've uh, checked with your weather, you know, radar weather, you know, where they show the radar, what's coming up and the storms and everything, a couple years ago, I remember, I remember seeing between here and West Africa, three tropical storms lined up, boom, 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 like that, one after the other, and they just pelted the coast of Florida, about two weeks apart from each other. Bam, a hurricane. Bam, another hurricane. Bam, another hurricane. The clouds in the sky just kept filling up with, filling up with water, dumping the water all over the state, and then they, new clouds, refilled. Dumped more water, new clouds, refilled. Dumped more water. The clouds returned after the rain. But, be, but this could be a, a picture then of as we age, we get hit with one thing after another, after another. You hurt your leg. You fall down. You break your hip. What happens after that? You're immobilized. You get the complications of immobility. Now you got that to deal with. And you get pneumonia because you hurt your leg, which caused you to fall down, which caused you to get immobile, which caused you to get uh, pneumonia, which it gets worse and worse. It's like one cloud after another dumps the rain on you, dumps the rain on you, dumps the rain on you. And it seems like, what is going on here, God? Really? Really? One thing after another, are you trying to beat me down? And you know what? It's not personal. It just is what it is. It's part of life. Perhaps a young person couldn't bear it. And perhaps you can. Because you've been through hard things. You've done this before. Verse 3, in the days when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down. Now, this is all poetry. The keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down. When the grinders cease because they are few. He's describing old age now. And those that look through the windows grow dim. What in the world are you talking about? Well, if, if the house here, the days when the keeper of the house tremble. If the house is your body, let's just say it's your body. What would the keepers of the house be? It might be the hands that minister to your body, the hands that feed you, the hands that, tie, that you use to tie your shoelaces, the hands that button all the buttons on your shirt. And it all works unless they tremble. In the days when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, what could be the strong men? What is this about bowing down? You see somebody who was proud and erect as a lieutenant colonel in the army and walking ramrod stiff, but that was the Korean War. And today, it's more like this. The strong men, the, the spine, the neck, the shoulders have bowed down. When the grinders cease because they are few. At first you might think, oh, you know, we're grinding wheat. We're grind no. What are they? Teeth. The grinders cease. Why? Because they're few. Well, this is 3,000 years ago. We don't have dentistry. And we had a culture, the culture here was built on grain and bread and crackers and such. You get all that grain packed into your teeth. And they didn't have dentistry and dental hygiene. And what happens when you get all that stuff start to turn starchy and sugary? In between your teeth starts to decay your teeth. Your teeth start falling out and getting ex extracted. And those that look through the windows grow dim. Well, what's a window? It's something you, you see through. You look outside. What could possibly grow dim about that? The only reason I'm not wearing glasses up here is because I got LASIK surgery in the year 2000. And they fixed all that. Otherwise, my glasses would be as thick as Coke bottle bottoms here. 
Well, the windows grow dim. Our eyesight fails and the, sh the print on your Bible starts to shrink of all things. Solomon is famous for his uh, symbolic language. He spoke uh, to the Shulamite, his young bride, and in the Song of Solomon, and he said, your teeth are like a flock of sheep, which have come up from the washing. You know, after you, you wash the wool on the sheep while it's still on the sheep so you can get all the dirt and manure out of it before you clip it because it's harder to wash then. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing, and everyone bears twins, and none is bereaved or barren among them. What is twins? It's matching teeth. Right incisor, left incisor. Right cuspid, left cuspid. Everyone is, has a twin. There's nothing missing. Verse 4, when the doors are shut in the streets... And the sound of grinding is low. When one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low. The doors are shut. This indicates, this could indicate a pair of doors. It's, it seems to have the sense of two doors. So what kind of doors might we have? Our sensory organs here. Two nostrils, two eyes, two lips that open the mouth, two ears. These doors in extreme old age start to shut. It's one of the last things to go is our, these senses. And the sound of grinding is low. You can't even clack your teeth together anymore um, because the molars are few. And you rise up at the sound of a bird. What's that? It's harder to sleep. And the sound of a nightingale at 3 a.m. You know, in our family, for some reason... We wound up, how many times was it? Three times living next to a railroad track? Let's see, yeah. So when we first were married, there was a railroad going right down the center of our street, like the center, lengthwise. And the train would come through at night, and we didn't have air conditioning, and we had a, our bedroom window just opened up right there to the front door to get the, this is in California, it was hot, and the train train would come through in the middle of the night and it woke me up like every time for the first two weeks and after that I, I can't even hear it anymore and then we moved a couple times and guess what we're right next to a railroad track again and we moved a couple times and guess what we're right next to a railroad track again I can't hear it but that's because I was working hard and being vigorous and getting falling into bed exhausted and tired at the end of the day when you when you get there's when you get to a certain age, it's like you're not doing that same level of activity. You're not falling into bed exhausted. And, and then if something wakes you at 3 a.m., you, you, you ain't going back to sleep. Just the, the twitter of a bird outside. When one rises up at the sound of a bird and, and all the daughters of music are brought low, well, that's easy to figure out. I can't hear the rock and roll anymore. Uh, you start to lose certain... Uh, uh, range of your hearing. I, I can't hear the, the beep of a thermometer, one of those electric thermometers. Uh, it goes, Dee! you know, it's really high pitched. I, I can't hear it. I have to have other people tell me, Dad, the thermometer beeped. Because I can't hear it. Too much rock and roll when I was in college. All the daughters of music are brought low. It's difficult to appreciate music now because the old woman or the old man has, has become hard of hearing. And they didn't have hearing aids. Also, they're afraid of height and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. I've been through the desert on a horse with no name. Nobody agrees on what this is about. But there's, there's theories, and, I, and I'll run a few by you here. The almond tree has been, has been compared to a, a head of gray hair, except for the, that just doesn't work because almond blossoms are pink. So there goes that one. The grasshopper, is it, the grasshopper becomes a burden. What? Well, one theory is this. They actually toasted locusts back then. It was popcorn for them. You know, you sprinkle a little salt and pepper on those guys and you... You roast them up in the skillet, and they're, they crunch and 
tasty. Um, but when it's too much trouble even to prepare a snack and to pop it into your mouth and to chew it and to enjoy it, that's pretty, that's a person who's uh, pretty far along, who can't prepare a snack. And desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. The streets. Desire fails. What, what desire could that be? It could be the, des the desire. One sense here is that uh, the grasshopper, one of the theories is that the grasshopper actually refers to sexual potency. The idea that you can have intimate relations in your marriage. And then, and, and then it makes sense that if desire fails, but also desire failing could be this, and I kind of lean more towards this, that um, there comes a point you lose ambition. Like you don't want to start big new projects anymore. And you're in, you may be in what you call your C career. You know, you, you're young, you have a, a career. You get to middle age, you have B career. And then you get to, you know, older, then you're in your C career, and you go, I don't want to start a new company anymore. I'm done with that. I'm ready to sell my investments and just take the cash and put them in municipal bonds and things like that. And yeah, I'm not taking risks anymore. No ambition. For man, why? And now he starts to bring it on home. For man goes to his eternal home. And now Solomon leaves no doubt. He's talking about dying. He's talking about dying. And the mourners go about in the streets. So remember, verse 6, your creator before the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the well, or the wheel broken at uh, uh, the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. So, what is this? A loosed cord, a broken bowl, a shattered pitcher, a broken wheel. What do they all have in common? These are all things that were fashioned by man for a purpose, and now they're so broken they can't serve the purpose anymore. This is speaking of the moments before death perhaps minutes before death. These things all be, these all are all dysfunctional now. You have no more control. One person has said uh, that the silver cord, and I can bear this out, you know, when you butcher uh, cattle or sheep, that spinal cord, it's silver. It's a silver gray kind of color. And the, the bowl, it's like a skull. You know, it doesn't, if it doesn't work anymore, if you're not thinking clearly. Jacob deceived his father, Isaac, in his old age because his father couldn't even tell one son from another. And Isaac was revered, and Isaac was the patriarch, but he was old, and he was losing his senses. And he had to feel, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the arms are hairy like Esau. Verse 7, then, says the preacher, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. So now he invokes the, the image of dust. From dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. Abraham said to the Lord, indeed, now I am but dust and ashes, and have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. In Ecclesiastes 3, we saw all go to one place, all are from the dust, and all return to dust. And in the common book of prayer, funeral service, we say, we therefore commit this body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Now, many scholars would say that the Jews didn't have a concept of eternal life, that the Jews at this time didn't have this idea of paradise, of an afterlife, that they focused on your afterlife would be your children who followed you afterwards. But clearly here, Solomon says, the dust will return to the earth as it was, but the spirit will return to God who gave it. 
So your body is already dead, says Solomon, but your spirit goes to be with God. That sounds like a concept of afterlife to me. That sounds like paradise to me, doesn't it to you? He knew it. And there's more evidence in the Old Testament as well. So we don't go along with the idea that the Jews served the living God but had no concept of an eternal reward. They did. They clearly did. I think this is very clearly a reference to the eternal spirit of man, which goes to God who dwells in the heavenly realm. And any talk of vanity here is simply, in this passage, is simply talking about life is short. It's short. Now, I don't want to leave us with just this thought about, oh, what's so good about growing old? Because there's plenty. There's so much good about growing old. God loves you. Isaiah 46, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnants of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me from birth, who have carried from the womb. So when you were a baby, when you were an infant, but even to your old age I am he, and even to gray hairs I will carry you, says God. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. Right up through your old age, right up through when you can't even see out of your eyes anymore and you can't hear the music anymore or the tone on the thermometer when it rings or the shrinkage of the letters in your Bible. And he is here to perfect you on earth while there is still the chance. Philippians 1, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, parentheses, when you were but a lad or but a lass, he who had began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's perfecting you every day. There is nothing vain about our continued existence as we get older. And come to think of it, is, is, your, is my aging day to day and your aging day to day the result of a sin that I do today so I get another day older? But if I didn't sin, I wouldn't get older? No. Aging is God's design for what's good for you. He brings you closer and closer to heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but don't nobody want to die. Funny thing about heaven is you got to die to go there. And there's only one way to die. you got to keep getting older. And the mercy, the intense mercy of God, is that you don't get to live forever on earth. He cuts it short. I will not strive forever with man. But 120 years shall be the limit. Nobody gets older than that anymore. Hardly. It's a mercy that we grow old and he takes us. Job 12. Wisdom is with the ancient ones. And length of days, and with length of days comes understanding. So hopefully we get wiser and wiser as we get older. Solomon was wise. First King says, King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had stood before his father Solomon while he still lived and said, how do you advise me to answer these people? Even the wisest king on earth at that time consulted the elders, people who were older than him. Now, our bodies fail. We start to accumulate injuries over time. You show me a 60-year-old who was a high school football player, and I will show you an injured 60-year-old. He still has the injuries from when he was 17 and kind of invulnerable. Thought he was Superman, couldn't get hurt, but he's still got football injuries from being a junior in high school. You accumulate these things. They keep going. And our bodies break down with the years. It doesn't mean we're worse for it. In fact, we're becoming ever more like Christ, hopefully, every year. 
Isaiah 40 tells us that we may find encouragement in remembering that the Lord will renew us as we wait upon him. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. So being young is not a guarantee of success. But those who wait on the Lord, those who find their comfort in the Lord, those who look to the Lord, especially as we get older, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Okay, most of us aren't going to go out and run a 10K race next week. But he's speaking in spiritual terms here. We bear greater discomfort in our flesh, but it's counterbalanced by the renewal of our souls daily. Older saints are God's guiding, guiding counselors to the young. You've lived through hard things. You've made mistakes and you've recovered. You have earned and lost and made back fortunes. Psalm 71 says, But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day. For I do not know their limits. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, of yours only. O God, you have taught me from my youth. And even to this day, I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation and your power to everyone who is to come. You have a mission, and I have a mission. And we dare not hope to, to see our lives finished until we've done everything we can to complete that mission. And what is the mission? To declare his strength to this, to declare his strength to this generation and his power to everyone who is to come. It's all about the next generation. Tell a young person. Build into a young person's life. Pray for them. Help them with a scholarship to get out of the public schools and into a school that they can benefit from. Just put, put feet to your care for young people. Give them a break. Give them a loan. Give them a recommendation or a lead on a job. Or just come up beside them like Uncle Bob or Aunt Mary and be there for them. This is what we can do as we get older. And remember, as we get older, we're getting closer to God and closer to our reward. Lord God, we thank you for this. We thank you for this encouragement. Solomon wasn't really very encouraging, it seemed like, at this point. But Solomon had a lot to regret. And you took him before he, became a, before he lived to a ripe old age. He taught us by illustration of his life that there's no fool like an old fool. We pray, God, that you keep us wise and that you use us Every year that we get older, that you use us more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. We're going to have the ladies uh, meeting right after this. If you have questions, ask Ruth. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to Firehouse Subs for, uh, for some food after this. Hang out with the guys.